We react to the big Ohio State win over Indiana. We review the commitment of the nation's number one quarterback in the class of 2022, Quinn Ewers, and we answer your questions next on the OHIO podcast. It's so easy to be average. You know it as well as I know it. It takes a little something to be special, Don. It takes a little something special to be a great player. We don't have enough great players. To hell with that! We don't want to coach average. I don't want to be around you. Why be around average? Be proud of our young people in the classroom, in the community, and most especially in 310 days in Ann Arbor, Michigan, on the football field. Three things. Number one, the team that hits the hardest and the longest, the team that starts the fastest, and the team is too damn smart to make mistakes. If you take it to them, if you don't make mistakes, and you keep taking it to them, hell, there's no question who will win. Buckeye Podcast, by fans, for the fans, where they hate that team up north as much as you do. It's time for the OHIO Podcast. OHIO! And welcome back to the OHIO Podcast. I am your host, Buckeye Boggs, recording live from beautiful, soggy, wet central Ohio, and I am joined by my co-host today, just a few miles north of me in Marion, Ohio, Chris Wilds. How's it going today, Chris? Well, it's just wonderful, Eric, and yourself? Yeah, um, other than Joe Burrow got carted off the field, uh, you know, it's been a good day other than that. But, uh, hey, man, a win's a win, um, and that is, uh, as they say, in the world in which we now live in, we have a lot to talk about with yesterday's game with Indiana. Chris, there's just so much that we need to get into with this game that we need to break down, and a lot of maybe overreaction from Ohio State fans and some who aren't reacting enough, possibly. So we're going to try to find that happy medium and try to find where this team is really at, Chris, as we get into the last part of this schedule. This week's fan of the week is Deb Gordon. She's originally from Chris's town, Marion, Ohio, but she currently lives in St. James City, Florida. And uh, Deb, I am not going to lie, I'm a little jealous right now. My favorite Buckeye is J.K. Dobbins, she says. And her favorite moment was winning the national championship a few years ago and 2014. Thank you so much, Deb, for uh, being a supporter of the OHIO podcast. And this week is dedicated to you and your fandom of our Buckeye. Side note, Chris, a little interesting story here. I contacted Deb to be the fan of the week after seeing uh, that she was uh, commenting on some of the stuff on our page. Come to find out her son and my wife went to school together. Well, that's nice. Yeah, so small world how this uh, this thing called Buckeye Nation is. But, uh, yeah, I thought that was pretty interesting. So have a great week, Deb, and we, uh, we appreciate your support uh, of our Buckeyes. All right, Chris, let's get right into it. Let's do what we always do, your initial reaction to yesterday's win, albeit a close one, against the Hoosiers. Well, my first initial reaction is Indiana is legit. Uh, and anybody who says they aren't just is wrong. I mean, this def- the defense was nothing short of disruptive yesterday. I mean, they forced Fields, who normally is just impeccable with, you know, not making mistakes, into three interceptions. They sacked them five times. Yes, they were bringing a lot of guys, but on a few of them, I think Fields just held the ball a little too long. Um, Indiana's offense definitely exposed some weaknesses we have in our secondary, which I think we've known, but maybe not seen to this level yet. Um, I mean, Penix Jr. put up 491 and five touchdowns. Try, uh, Ty Frogel, Fry Fogel, uh, just dominated the corners, uh, pretty much, you know, did what he wanted out there. Seven catches, 218 and three touchdowns. Now, that being said, Ohio State took everything Indiana had to offer and still came away with the win. Um, Despite having fields out there, having what was definitely a down game, 
Now, most people probably wouldn't consider a 60% completion rating and 300 yards and two touchdowns a down game. But with the three interceptions and the five sacks for, for a Heisman contender like Fields, that is a down game. Uh, however, the offense did have some positives out there. Uh, Wilson and Alave, again, both went over 100 yards receiving. Uh, the much maligned run game that we get so many comments about week after week actually showed up. You had uh, Master Teague, Trey Sermon, and, and Justin Fields combined for 307 yards, 6.1 a carry, and three touchdowns. And that was, of course, led by the 26 carries and 169 uh, yards and two touchdowns by Master Teague, who really came out and kind of placed his uh, his stamp on being the lead back. Um, the defensive line, I felt, was okay. They were rather pedestrian as far as the pass rush goes, but they did help out in the run game. And aside from Wade's pick six, Indiana did pretty much have their way with our defensive backs. But I did feel the linebacker play was really pretty solid. I mean, we held them to a negative one rushing, which is anytime you keep somebody at negative yards rushing, that's a positive. Uh, and they also, I thought, did a pretty good job with the underneath coverage. So overall, I mean, yes, we have some concerns, but I'm not worried. <laughs> so <clears throat> I think as a fan base, Chris, we all need to just take a collective deep breath and sigh. That was close. Yes, there's definitely things that we need to be worried about. Really one specific unit, if you ask me. Outside of that, I'm going to go into a deep dive of, of some stats that you did not mention, Chris, that I think are really important to point out. Yes, Indiana had 490 yards, negative one yard rushing, like you said. Ohio State had 607 total yards, 300 passing, 307 rushing. You don't get much better than that when it comes to ha having a running and a passing game firing on all cylinders. Now, I understand that there were some bad interceptions. Just, well, two of the three, Justin just trying to do too much, if you ask me. He should have just ate it. But 27 first downs for Ohio State to 19 for Indiana. Third down efficiency, we were 6 of 14. We can do a little better than that. Indiana was 4 of 13. We ran 80 total plays to their 67. Again, um, Indiana had some big explosive plays thanks to uh, the the passing of Penix down the field, and our, and our defensive backfield was just inept in the second half. But, again, 80 total plays to 67. That is also translates well to time of possession. 36-24 to the Buckeyes, 22-58 to Indiana. Also, some another sign that I thought was very positive outside of the rushing game, Chris, that you mentioned. We only had three penalties for 35 yards. That's much, much better. So we improved in some areas that the last time we were playing – we pointed out we're not good, and we made those improvements. This team, and, and again, I know a lot of you who might be listening to this are diehard Buckeye fans, and you saw what Chris and I saw in the second half against Indiana, and you saw what we saw in the second half against Rutgers, and you saw what we saw in the second half against Penn State. There is a trend. In the second half, our defense, especially in the defensive backfield, is getting burned in the second half. Teams are making an adjustment, and we are unable in the defensive backfield to make that readjustment to their adjustment. And you can tell we are blowing coverages. We are in the wrong place at the wrong time. You see guys arguing with each other after a big play. I thought you had them. No, I thought you had them. These are things that can be corrected in two areas. Number one, film study. And number two, taking what you learned in film study and translating it into the practice field and then seeing it work in the game. This is a young, young secondary, and we are watching a young secondary take some serious lumps as they grow up. And they don't have time to grow up, unfortunately. We don't have a Bowling Green. We don't have a Buffalo this year. 
We didn't have an Oregon away game. We had none of that to, to force ourselves to, to get better in the defensive backfield and to see these things happen and then make those adjustments and grow properly before the Big Ten season starts. We have to do it now. Then there's unfortunately no time to do it. And so not only do we have a brand new defensive coordinator in Kerry Combs, who is making basically his first ever, this is the first time ever of him being in control of an entire defense. And so he's going through growth spurts as well. And you take the accumulation of that and you take what we're seeing with these young guys in the defensive backfield and it's, it's equating to problems in the defense. Thankfully, our defensive line is still pretty good. And our linebackers are playing out of their minds right now, Chris. Otherwise, this would be a 2018 defense. But I still hold on to hope that as the weeks go on in Illinois and Michigan State and against that team up north, they can start to correct these mistakes in the defensive backfield and we can get ourselves a championship defense out there on the field. Because one thing is for sure, our offense is championship level. And Justin Fields played his worst game ever as a Buckeye and still had 300 yards passing and and still looked amazing in the first half. So take a deep breath. Let, I, the, obviously, the coaching staff, Chris, they see everything that we do. They're not dumb. They're not blind. Let's take a deep breath and let's hope that we get healthy and improve in the areas that we saw yesterday against Indiana, which is the best team We've played all year. Uh, you're right, Chris. They're pretty good. I think they're a top 10 team, and I think they might even be better than a top 10 team. I think they might be somewhere around the 7 8 range in the nation from what I saw yesterday. So yeah, that's, that's my kind of collective thoughts as we move forward here. All right. <clears throat> Offensive grade, Chris. Uh, I went with a B for the offense. I thought the running game was exceptional. Um, I was glad to see him get out there and really start, you know, getting that push. You know, we got up to averaging 6.1 a carry, which is great. Uh, Fields' numbers were actually solid with the exception of the three interceptions. I mean, so that there wasn't – and, again, I think much like you said, those interceptions came from just trying to do too much. Whether it was overconfidence in his ability or whether it was just he felt that something had to be done at that time. Yeah, I think he just pushed a little hard. Our receivers were great again. Um, outside of, you know, the, the sacks and the interceptions, I thought we were really solid. But I thought the sacks and interceptions were enough to drop us to a B. All right, I'm going to go with A-. <clears throat> and, um, again, you mentioned it, the sacks, the interceptions. Two of those interceptions, he just needs to eat it. The first one was bad. That was just a bad read. Uh, but 607 yards, man. That's... <laughs> That's something you – 607 yards. It's impressive. It's very impressive. Very impressive. And about the sacks. Now, there, yeah, he he, he held on the ball too long. Um, a five, I think there was – what was it? Five sacks Indiana had? Five sacks, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Um, <clears throat> we're going to get into the offensive line. Someone asked a question. When we do our Facebook questions – Someone asked a question about the offensive line. So I'm going to I'm going to hold off on the offensive line right now and explain to you what happened yesterday, because, um, yeah, there, there's there's a reason for that. And I thought the offensive line, believe it or not, Chris, actually improved, even though they gave up five sacks the, I saw a great improvement from them yesterday. So we're going to get into that question in a little bit. So I'm going to hold off on that. But I'm going to go A-, minus 607 yards, 300 on the ground. Man, they could not stop us running the football. We even – Trey Sermon had – even Trey Sermon had a decent game. As I look up his stats here real quick, uh, 15 carries for 70 oh, – I'm sorry, that was Justin Fields. Nine carries, 60 yards. That's 6.7 a carry for Trey Sermon. That's if that's your change of pace back, which is what I think he's become. Uh, it was obvious that's what he is now, Chris. After yesterday, he's your change of pace back. He is the number two. He is not. This is not a 50-50 share anymore. That that's obvious. No. Uh, nine no, carries, agree. sixty yards, six point seven per carry. Master T twenty six for one sixty nine, six point five yards per carry. Um, yeah. When you do that to the tune of three hundred seven yards. 
when you add in Justin 78. Yeah, I w- I'm going to give you an A minus. Clean up a little bit of those of those interceptions. Learn how to eat it or throw it away, and don't hold on the ball so long. Some of those sacks, like I'm going to say, I'm going to get into that in a minute, but some of those sacks are on him. Um, but outside of that. I'm going to go A minus, and, and if you clean those things up right there, we we hang 60 on them, and this is a this is a totally different conversation we're happening having today. So uh, yeah, I'm going to go A minus. How about the defense, Chris? Uh, the defense, I went with a B minus. Um, the defensive line, while I thought they were adequate in the running game and assisting with the running game, they just didn't get the pressure on the quarterback only accounting for one sack, uh, and that was the one by Cooper. Um, the defensive backs, again, they, they got roughed up. And like you said, I think that's the one area, the one the one portion of the team that we really need um, to have major improvement with. Uh, you know, Penix pretty much did what he wanted to out there. Now, and that's not to take anything away from him because he he, he played a phenomenal game, but, you know, we had some bad tackling again out there. And then the, you know, some some missed coverages. Uh, the linebackers I thought played well. You know, as I said earlier, you know, we kept them to minus one yard on the ground. Um, I thought they did a pretty decent job in coverage out there. I think the the linebackers were actually definitely the uh, the strength of the defense out there yesterday. Mhm. Yep, I agree. <clears throat> uh, I actually went with a C. Um, I thought the first half was an A. I thought the first half the defense really had a good game plan and they executed that game plan and we were really stifling Penix and this Indiana team. They 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 could not run the ball. And when they abandoned the run, when when Indiana said forget it, we're not even going to try it anymore and just went straight past, that's when you saw them exploit our weakness on defense. Our defensive backs gave us an F in the second half, uh, a flat out F. Now a good coach is going to say it's not on, on not all on them. You've got to get pressure up front, and there were times when we just were not getting home. But it, we were playing really soft coverage, and Indiana was hitting some some crossing routes, shallow crossing routes, where we didn't have a defender within five to ten yards of them. That's coaching. That's that's afraid you're going to get burnt, and you're playing you're playing back deep because you're just afraid you're going to get burnt, and we were still getting burnt. So there's a, there's some cleaning up to do in that secondary big time this week uh, in the film studying on, on practice field. So I'm going to give them a C defensively and say we've got uh, we got some work to do there. All right, let's go with as we move forward here, uh, since we've given you now our uh, grades for offense and defense, let's go ahead and pass out some Buckeye leaves, Chris. Your offensive player of the game? Uh, it's not Justin Fields. I know, right? <laughs> which, which which has been something. But you know what? In a sense, I'm glad it wasn't. Because what that shows us is we can go out there and win even when Justin has a bad day. And we can win against a quality opponent when Justin has a bad day. I went with Master Teague. I just thought the, the rushing performance was phenomenal. I thought it was great to see our, our rushing game actually really impose itself on, on a again, a quality defense. Make that two of us. I went with Master Teague as well. And it was an I thought yesterday Master Teague won this game in a lot of ways by helping us control the line of scrimmage offensively uh, by getting some of those hard hard nosed runs. And he busted one off finally. Um, is Master Teague J.K. Dobbins? No, he's a different kind of back. Um, he's more of a Joe Montgomery style. I mean, he's going to make a cut and go. Um, is that cut as as pretty looking as a J.K. Dobbins jump cut or a Zeke Elliott hard cut uh, and then track speed? No, but you know what? It's still effective. And as he's getting more comfortable and more confidence, uh, remember, he's coming off an injury in spring ball to his Achilles. Uh, that's pretty impressive that he's even playing right now, to be honest. And he's getting more confident and he's getting healthier. And I think we're going to see Master T continue to start to improve as a ball carrier. And the other thing I like about what I saw 
and I mentioned it before a little bit in my initial reactions, is the coaching staff is now going to let him reach that that place where he's getting 20-plus carries, and he's going to start to wear on a defense. So in the first half, those two, three-yard carries. In the second half, they're six, seven, eight-yard carries now because he's just he's just busting you and wearing on that defensive line. And so sometimes there are there are ball carriers that seem to get stronger as the game goes on. Uh, Nick Chubb for one for in Cleveland, right? Same same thing. I think as a game goes on, uh, you're going to see Master T get better. And so I like the fact that he is now basically our number one running back, and Trey Sermon is our change of pace guy because I think as as the he gets more carries in a game, you're going to see him bust off bigger carries, bigger yards. So I'm going with uh, Master Teague as my offensive player of the game as well. Your defensive player of the game. I went with Pete Werner for the defensive player of the game. Eight tackles, sack, a forced fumble. And I'll tell you, that sack came at a really critical time in the game, too. So that's why I went with Pete Werner. He just he just just all over the place out there yesterday. That's so funny. I, we're right on we're 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 right on the same wavelength again. Pete Warner, five solo tackles, three assisted, the big sack like you mentioned, and I loved I loved his enthusiasm and energy in this game. When he would make a big play, or you would see him coming off of the sideline, Pete Warner has got some juice to him. He has got some he has got some bulldog in him, and I love that. I like my linebackers to be leaders, and Pete Warner is becoming that. And I know his the stats didn't show it yesterday, but Tough Borland is that as well. And he had a really good game. Tough Borland did the job of clogging the middle of that defense um, when it came to the run all day yesterday. Indiana could not run the football, and a lot of that's because Tough Borland just wouldn't let him move anywhere. Even though he might have not gotten a tackle, if you notice, he was plugging the A-gap all game long, and they would bounce out to try to get the run to the outside. Pete Warner, uh, Baron Browning was there. Your defensive ends, Jonathan Cooper was there. Uh, Baron Browning had eight tackles yesterday. So, yeah, I went with Pete Warner as well. Big sack. I love his leadership. Love his juice. So we're right on the same page there with one another, Chris. All right, this one's going to be interesting. Your offensive play of the game. My offensive play of the game started out as offense, but turned into defense. Oh, my gosh. Uh, you did it, not. You did not it steal was it. Julian oh, Freeman you stole it. He channeled his inner Maurice Claret and got out there. And I'll tell you, at a time when that turnover could have turned into serious momentum for a very hyped up Indiana team, you know, he got in there and made that play, got us the ball back. And uh, just I think that was a game changing moment. I thought for sure you wouldn't pick that one. Oh, that's hilarious. I thought I was being so smart when I picked that one as my offensive play of the game. It was, it really was. It was the Maurice Claret play It is exactly what it was. And for a freshman to do that, you know, he, he didn't, he didn't have, he's not had any moments where you, you went, wow, this kid is going to be amazing. You know, like uh, we've seen from Jackson Smith and the Jigba when he had that toe tap in the opening game. Uh, we've not re- we've not seen that from from Julian Fleming, but for him to have the wherewithal and the the not giving up to go make that play, that was a veteran move. And has isn't it funny that we we all automatically go to Maurice Corrette in the championship game against Miami when we saw that we all we all thought of that. They were both freshmen when it happened, and that and that interesting. That's good for good on Julian Fleming. He gets my offensive play of the game. Buckeye Leaf as well. Your defensive play or hit of the game? Uh, the play of the game, I went with the Werner sack. I mean, okay. I, think, I think that was just such a critical play at a critical time. Um, you know, it really kind of all but shut the door for Indiana. Yes, it did. Very, very good. I actually went with the Sean Wade pick six. I and mean, I debated. Yeah, and that's and and I'll tell you why that one because if we don't have that, we're tied. Right. So that was a that was a big big play, and Indiana has the ball and, and is moving to go for the win. So um, that that was a huge play for me, and I, I think that was I did that I think that really has a lot to do maybe for Sean Wade and turning the corner on the outside and getting him some confidence moving into these last uh, 
three, four games here in the Big Ten because that maybe hopefully is what he can say. You know what? It was that moment when I started playing NFL first-round draft grade cornerback in the on the outside because so far he's not done that. He's actually hurt his draft status this year. So hopefully that one will help out um, as we move forward here. All right, so there's your Buckeye Leafs for the week against Indiana. Let's go ahead and move on to the Facebook poll. Uh, Chris, I don't know if you got if you saw this or not, this Facebook poll that I posted yesterday, but it is incredibly interesting. So <clears throat> I said, now that today's win is, win is over, over Indiana has sunk in, how do you feel about today's game and the Buckeyes moving forward? Here, here were your uh, options. Option number one, great. A win is a win. Option number two, good, but our defense needs to improve. Option number three, okay, but we have some serious holes on this team. Option number four, not good. We are going to lose in the playoffs. Or option number five, terrible. The sky is falling in Columbus. Those were your five options. So, a lot of you voted on this. We had almost 100 votes, believe it or not. Receiving zero votes was terrible. The sky is falling in Columbus. Thankfully, none of you were ready to jump off a, off a tall building or bridge after yesterday's win. One vote for not good. We're going to lose in the playoffs. Five votes for great. A win is a win. <laughs> I love the enthusiasm and positivity of those five people. And then overwhelmingly, these next two, and they were neck and neck. Now, one had 41 votes. The other one had 40. They were good, but our defense needs to improve. And the other one was okay, but we have some serious holes on this team. Chris, would you like to take a stab on which one received one more vote? Well, I'm going to go and, and, and like to think that my vote counted. And I'm going to say... I feel good that our defense needs to improve because I really don't feel that we have so much holes as we just have some developmental issues. All right. You know what? Your vote did make the difference because that was the one with 41. That was also what I voted, Chris. Good, but our defense needs to improve. Um, <clears throat> serious holes says to me that we're going to lose one to Purdue or Iowa. Right. Because right. in, in, in 2018 and in 2017, we saw that happen. We saw we saw that there was serious holes on our team and we were going to it was going to bite us in the butt. And sure enough, it did against someone that it shouldn't have in Purdue and in, uh, in Iowa. And so <clears throat> that's what to me when I think of, OK, but we have some serious holes in this team. That's what's going to happen. I don't see that happening in the Big Ten. If there was one team I thought that was really going to challenge us, it was going to be Wisconsin. After yesterday's games, Chris, Indiana's the second best team in the Big Ten, in my opinion. So, and given how we played, especially in the first half, I think we are, I think we should take this as this was a good win, but our defense needs to improve specifically in the secondary. That's how I look at it. Is that how you look at it, Chris? Chris? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, you know, our offense is a championship, like you said, championship caliber offense. Our defense, we need work. But like I said, I think we have more developmental issues based on the, you know, the, the quick start and the lack of a preseason and pre Big Ten season. Um, I mean, honestly, we would be coming to the end of our pre Big Ten season, you know, this week in a normal, on a normal basis. Right. So I think it's more a developmental issue with some of the younger guys. I don't think we have holes. I think we have the talent. It just needs to be um, developed. Yep. Now, it was interesting. Yesterday, I don't know if you got a chance to watch the post-game press conference after the game uh, yesterday. Ryan Day mentioned something. This team, as of yesterday, the game, this team has only had 51 practices. 51 practices would equate to us being somewhere around the second game of the week in a regular season. Second, a second game of the season. 
that's what that's what we're expecting from this team right now. We're expecting them to be in almost end of season form, and we're really at week two. If right. you actually want to look at a normal year, and this isn't a normal year. I mean, this is a this is a messed up year. And if if you don't believe that, just look at the landscape of college football right now. A uh, winning and advancing is is all you can do. I mean, if you're doing that, you're ahead of the game. I mean, that's it. You're 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 really lucky right now. I mean, even Clemson's not undefeated, guys. So there is some there's some I think there's some overreaction taking place here in our fan base where and, and I'm the same way. I'm I'm just like any other fan. I get upset, I yell at the TV, I I scream and what are you doing? And Marcus Hooker is out of position again and he's acting like an idiot after you know they score a touchdown and there's there's so many things that I get upset about. But when you take a step back and you take a breath and you really analyze what's happening and you see we have a new defensive coordinator, we have zero experience in the secondary outside of Sean Wade, and and these these young guys have a new coaching staff that they're working with, and have only had 51 practices to try to iron this stuff out. It's like it makes sense. It actually makes sense what we're seeing a little bit. So it could be worse. We could be Indiana's uh, all for broke defense. I mean. Yeah, they did some really awesome things and created some turnovers, but boy, they were getting gashed, weren't they? And again, I'll get into that in a second. So I'm not going to say the sky's falling in. I'm not going to overreact and say that there's serious holes on this team. I think there is a weakness on this team, absolutely. And that weakness got it is getting exposed in the second half of games. And the coaching staff obviously knows that, Chris. They're going to work on that. And so hopefully we can continue to work on that and get better every single week. So that was this week's Facebook poll question. Very good, guys. Thank you so much for everybody who participated in that. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and when we come back, we are going to answer your questions. We've got a a slew of some really good questions that were submitted to us, Chris. And then we're going to talk about the big commitment from this week, man. We want to talk about some serious mojo happening Inside the Woody Hayes Athletic Center with this coaching staff, there is something special happening when it comes to recruiting with Ohio State. And, of course, we're going to take a trip around what was a crazy, crazy weekend in the Big Ten as well. So hang tight, everybody. When we come back, we're going to jump part, jump into the second half of this show. The OHIO Podcast is brought to you by Mastermind. Mastermind specializes in 360-degree high-definition mobile video mapping, GIS integration, and traffic safety studies. Mastermind cares about traffic safety and keeping you safe on the roadway. Visit Mastermind at OnlineMastermind.com. All right, welcome back to the OHIO podcast, everybody. Let's get right into it, Chris. Here is the first question, and this comes from a longtime listener and friend of the show, Scott Rogers. <clears throat> Scott, by the way, is an intelligent fan. There is no doubt about that. He knows what he's doing. He also he's a coach too. So um, Scott, Scott, when he watches the the game in sports, he watches as a coach. I know that uh, just by having some conversations with him. So. He says, I'm not here to bash. We are 4-0. And we just won a big game against a top-10 team that just keeps getting better in Indiana. Yeah, they're, they're, they have some serious confidence, don't they? But my questions are, do you think it's the Buckeyes' defensive scheme that is hurting us and we just don't have the players to play the scheme? I think he's talking about the single high safety scheme that we continue to run, Chris. Um, watching the game, I noticed that if – a IU receiver did a curl or a quick in our D backs were still in their back pedal, giving the receiver plenty of room for the reception. And then it seems to, um, seems our, and then it seems our open field tackling, not all the time, but some is not as good as it has been in the past. We are four weeks in the season and the improvement is not where I would like it to be. My second question is about Wade. A great talent, but do you think the talent we had on the defensive back backfield last year covered up a lot of his flaws? He is not having a great season, but a good one. 
Maybe I am wrong in what I see, but I would love some feedback from others. Great question, Scott. And a lot of people jumped in and started giving him feedback and their two cents from his questions on our fans group page yesterday. But we're going to go ahead and we're going to answer this as well, Scott. Chris, I'm going to let you take the first one. Is do we just don't do we just not have the personnel this year to run that single high safety defense that Ryan Day is basically forcing um, Kerry Combs to run? It, it, do you think is that the issue? What do you think is going on there? Um, I honestly don't know whether it's so much we don't have the personnel or whether it's just the lack of experience. Um, as you've said before, um, you know, the scheme we're kind of doing is we're, is we're almost playing a bend but don't break out there, trying to keep everything in front of us because we, we do seem to be afraid that they're going to get behind us. So, Which they are anyways. <laughs> and they, they, they are anyways. But I think that's kind of what's what's occurring is, you know, we're, like he said, with the curls underneath, you know, we're still on our back pedal and then we're failing to tackle. You know, I think that's a big part of it right there is the yards after the contact, because there's, we should yeah, be bringing these people down. Yeah, there is one tackler in this defensive backfield. One. His name's Josh Proctor. Exactly. And he, and he almost had the hit of the game because he came in on that special teams and lit that dude up. Um, Josh Proctor's a hitter. He is a, he is an enforcer on defense, which is why he's playing the bullet. Okay. Right. And so I think this is the issue, Scott, is we don't have someone like a Jordan Fuller. That's the issue. Jordan Fuller in the single high safety last year cleaned up a lot of messes, cleaned them up a lot. We just aren't seeing that from Marcus Hooker. Marcus Hooker is young inexperienced and he is not Jordan Fuller and it is obvious. So the answer to your question is yes and no. Yes. I don't think we have the personnel to have that, to run that scheme yet. Will we get there? Hopefully. Um, otherwise I think you're going to start, see us maybe start, go back to, um, to safe a two safety look. But the, the problem with that is, is now we draw Proctor out of the box where he has been most effective this year and basically shutting down tight ends. If you've not noticed, no tight end has burned us this year. That is that is Baron Browning and Josh Proctor taking the tight end out of a, of a team's offense. And so that's actually working out well. The problem is is that puts more pressure on Marcus Hooker on the back end to not get burned, and he's he's become toast. The dude is the dude is is Swiss toast, man. He is just um, or Wonder Bread, I should say. He is Wonder Bread back there. He has been toasted every game, and it's not good. Um, the other thing, the other question about Wade. Here's my two cents, and Chris, I'll turn it over to you after I give my two cents. I think Wade is an amazing talent. I think he's learning how to be a learning how to be a cornerback. I think he is his slot cornerback skills are amazing, but on the outside, I think he's struggling. And so I think that maybe is what we're seeing from him currently. I could be wrong, but that's my two cents because if you go turn the film on from last year, I don't care who's on the outside, whether it was Okuda, Arnett, you name it. Uh, Sean Wade was basically a blanket on the slot receiver. And we we're and we we're just not seeing that same thing when he's on the outside. I think he's learning how to play the position, which if you remember, that was the, that was the knock on him from the NFL scouts. Yeah, you're great at the slot, but we want to see you on the outside. Now they're seeing that, and now they're seeing that flaw. He's got to improve there. Chris, your thoughts on Wade on the outside? Yeah, I agree. I think it's the the switch in position from the slot to that outside uh, cover position that's that's giving him problems, and he is just learning. So, um, yeah, you know, I think I think we see flashes right now of of the talent that he has. Um, I'm hoping that by the end of the season he develops because I do believe that uh, what we've seen so far has hurt his draft stock for the year. But, you know, I think that he has it in him to be that outside corner. I just don't think that he fully knows the position yet. Yep, I, I agree. Michigan fan Sean Butler wants to know. <laughs> this might be Sean Butler trying to rub it in a little bit. I don't know, but I love you, Sean. 
why didn't you just kick the dang field goal? <laughs> so we're up seven, right? It's fourth and one. We didn't get the first down on the third and four. We got a three-yard gain on Justin Fields running the football to the left. And so now it's a fourth and one, and Ryan Day goes for it. And as Joel Klatt and um, Gus Johnson said, he got pretty on his on his uh, play call on fourth down, and we didn't get it. Um, why didn't we kick the field goal there? Now, I've got some thoughts. Chris, I'll let you answer first. Why didn't Day choose to kick the field goal and go up 10, two, uh, which would be two possessions, at that point in the game? You know, my thought is this. Um, we're moving the ball well. I don't like the play call, but I don't have a problem with not kicking the field goal. The other thing is we have to remember we do have a relatively um, young field goal kicker right now. Yep. And, you know, that's a lot of pressure in a big game like this. So I, I, I would have preferred to see us, you know, with one yard to go, give that ball to Master Teague or even have field, you know, just push up the middle on a sneak. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't have a problem with the call of necessarily going for it. I do have issue with what they tried to do. They basically, they did. They tried to get cute and they, they fancied themselves right out of the first down. All right, so you're right. We have a young field goal. He's a our field goal kicker. He's a freshman. He missed one earlier in the game. Right. So his confidence is probably already sh shaking a little bit. Um. So and and if if you get blocked right there, if that field goal gets blocked and they return it, it's a tied game. So there's some risk to that that we as Buckeye fans uh, have experienced before. So. That's that. That's maybe why we go with that there. Now the play call is interesting because if you remember, this is almost identical to the play call we had on fourth and one against Penn State that we scored a touchdown on, and it was to the tight end, and that's exactly who Justin Fields was looking for. The problem was Indiana had it red like a blanket. They were ready for that, and so would. I thought he was going to wait and then run up to the line of scrimmage real quick, snap the ball, and push forward and do a QB sneak. But I think what Day was wanting to do right there was, is let's go for the jugular, let's take this thing out, we'll roll Justin out, and he'll either run it in or there'll be a wide open tight end, and Indiana read it like a book. They were ready for that. So you got to give Indiana some credit for that. That's coaching, and that's game preparation right there. Um, I would say eight times out of ten, we probably get the first down or score a touchdown right there on that game, on that, on that call. So I'm, I'm not terribly against the call. I just Actually, I just give Indiana credit for stopping it. Good on them. They were ready for it. But, yeah, I mean, if, if, it, was, if it was a guaranteed three points, obviously we're going to take the points and make it a two-possession game. But you're also putting them in place if we don't get it. They've got to drive the entire length of the field, too. So I, I, I don't have any problem with that call. Deb Gordon, our fan of the week. And this is where I wanted to get into this. Where was the offensive line today? Okay. Great question, Deb. Um, I have become someone who watches offensive line play during a course of a game more than just about any position. And um, maybe it's because I'm a big dude and I, I, I just kind of know if I would have played, I probably would have been on the line. <clears throat> but here's what I saw yesterday. We tried to prepare everybody for this. If you go back and you listen to our, law, our last podcast, episode 118, Chris, I told everybody because I, I previewed the Indiana defense. This defense plays a 3-3-5. Three, three, um, <clears throat> which means three down linemen, three linebackers, um, and five defensive backs. And sometimes, and they did this a little bit yesterday, but mostly they were in the 3-3-5, three, three, they'll play a 4-2-5, meaning four down linemen, two linebackers, and five defensive backs. The reason why they love to play that defensive set is it gives them blitz options where they can blitz from any position on the field. And I do mean any position, including cornerbacks and safeties. 
okay? They are bringing a blitz all the time. And I told you they are blitzing anywhere from 85 to 90% of plays during a game. They are bringing a blitz from somewhere. And we saw that yesterday. For the most part, other than about three or four times, our offensive line picked up those blitzes and our running back picked up that blitz and our tight ends picked up those blitzes and did a phenomenal job. There was three times where Justin Fields got hit or sacked where we missed the blitz completely. Didn't, or we olayed them. We saw the blitz coming and um, our offensive lineman moved to his left or to his right because he thought he saw the shift and he didn't have to. And the, and the blitzer came right up the middle and hit Justin. And gave or gave him little time to throw the ball. There was three or four times where that happened in the course of the entire game. For the most part, we did that. Ryan Day said in the post post game co- news conference that style of defense is all it's 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 great if it works, and if it doesn't, you hit them for big plays. What happened the very first play of the game for us? We drilled them down the middle of the field on Garrett Wilson, right? They were on an all-out blitz to start that game. So it's an all-or-nothing style defense. And given the fact that we had 607 yards of offense, I would say they gave up nothing on that defense quite a bit as far as what they got in return. So the fact that they got five sacks and the fact that they hit Justin uh, you know, seven, eight times and they made him uncomfortable – That's what you're going to see every single game Indiana plays. If Indiana plays Notre Dame, Clemson, heck, Alabama, you're still going to see that style of defense work like that against the big boys. But they're also going to give up that many yards, too, okay? Because they are literally sometimes bringing more blitzers than you have blockers. And so Ohio State was forced to play max protection a lot, and still, they still were able to get uh, wide receivers open quite a bit. Now, when you're in max protection and your receivers can't get open, that's when you saw Justin Fields look, 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 couldn't find somebody, and then try to scramble, okay, because there was no one else to throw the ball to. That's where Justin Fields has to learn to throw the football away, and he didn't, Chris. So that is not on the offensive line. That was on Justin Fields. That, if there's anything in his game, he has got to learn how to do outside of sliding or getting down and not trying to be Superman driving into the end zone. It is throw the football away. Learn to play for another day. Here's why he didn't, though. Justin Fields had more touchdowns than he did incompletions, and that got in his head. And that's why those interceptions, those two interceptions, those bad ones, happened. He was trying to make a play. You could tell that stat got in his head, and he didn't just throw the football away. He's got to learn a smart quarterback, although his pass completion percentage was astronomical, a smart quarterback will learn to throw the football away. That also protects your offensive line. They're protecting you. You have to protect them a little bit. Justin Fields did not do that. I hope I explained that well, Chris. What do you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree 100% with that. Um, and, and, you know, on a side note as well, it's not just with the passing game and their protection. Let's not forget, they really got some push on the run game as well. So it's kind of very, it's very hard for me to ding the offensive line for everything or for anything in that game yesterday. Like you said, maybe three plays – where they got to Justin, you might you, you might blame a missed block, but for the most part, they played an exceptional game. Yep. In 2014, our offensive line became the best in the nation, became a bunch of road graders, and with Zeke Elliott, that's what won us the national championship. It wasn't the passing game. I mean, Cardale Jones could throw the ball a mile, and of course they had to, you know, he was throwing these deep balls all the time and that were working, but – it was the running game that won us those, that championship. This offensive line yesterday, you mentioned it, Chris. 
they're starting to get very confident in the run game. They are making some holes. And when they start to do that, coupled with their pass protection, which they, again, Indiana was probably the hardest team they're going to play all year when it comes to pass, pass pro. Coupled with that, this offensive line can get there. That gives me to my next question from Justin Bowman. Coming into the season, there were talks of the O-line being the best in the country and one of the top lines in school history. So far, that has not been the case. They are getting much better in run blocking, but have been average to below average in protecting Justin. Why do you think that is, and do you think they can become the line we thought they could be? Um, Let me continue where I was at, Justin, with this offensive line. Offensive line play so much has to do with knowing the guy to your left or right, unless you're the tackles, and then and then you have to know your tight end if he's there or not. It is understanding who has who when it comes to protecting Justin when there's a blitz. And so some of that is pre-snap communication. A lot of it, though, is just experience, seeing something that you've seen before, and knowing how the guy to your left or right is going to react. It takes time. That is why it is it is vital and is so important that an offensive line gels and has good chemistry and that they can stay healthy throughout the season. The fact that so far we've stayed healthy and this offensive line, I think, is starting to develop chemistry. Maybe we were a little premature on calling them the best offensive line in school history. But I do believe that they are on the precipice of getting to that level that 2014 was. It's just going to take more game times, more reps, and getting familiar with each other. Do not, do, don't forget, the right tackle, first time he's ever started, NPF this season, Nicholas petit Frere. Um, left tackle, or left guard, Harry Miller. He's only a sophomore, first time he's ever started. There's, there's just going, it's just going to take time for these guys to gel, but I believe they can get there. Um, Chris, anything you want to add to that? Well, I just think I'm really seeing improvement along the line. Something that you mentioned earlier, we can see that improvement, not only in the blocking, but in the area of not being penalized, um, which was, which was huge yesterday. Yes, so exactly. I, I think they are starting to develop and get that chemistry. As you said, it's going to be a process, and I think we just have to give them the time and the game reps to get it done, which is one of the big reasons that, it, you know, it really was kind of, you know, it does kind of hurt that we had to miss out on that Maryland game because that was four yep. valuable quarters that we could have used to help uh, get that line in shape. Exactly, exactly, which would have been great to get before, you know, uh, here. Indiana, in my opinion, again, <clears throat> I've, I've watched a lot of Big Ten football so far this season. Indiana is the second best team in the Big Ten. If they were in the West, that it would be who we would play in in uh, Indianapolis. They're that good. I'm sorry. Their, def- their defensive scheme is unique, guys. It is very unique. It's the, it, You know what it's similar to? Virginia Tech. Mm-hmm. Remember what happened in 2014 when we played Virginia Tech? We lost. They beat us at home. And we went on to win a national championship that year. This this is the Virginia Tech of our season. And we just beat them. Okay? So let's take a deep breath, step back, and realize, hey, this offensive line actually played pretty well when you break it down. This is my guess. This is uh, This is totally my guess. I believe that when they release the champions for the week later this week, I think it's on Tuesday, mark it down. Four, at least four of those offensive linemen will be graded as champion for that game. Which sounds crazy that that they would be graded as champions when there was five sacks. But mark it down. As I watched that game, they all, almost all of them played really well. NPF had a lapse where he let it, he had, he got beat one-on-one and gave up a sack and he had a holding call. Other than that, those like, two out of three plays he had right there in a series, he had a really good game too. And he might be the only one that doesn't get graded out as a champion. It might be all five. I don't know. But they played really, really well, believe it or not. All right. Eric Osbeck. 
Our run defense is spectacular. Our offense scored 35. There are positives. Yes, there are, Eric. Thank you. Should we fear Illinois, or is the IU game our annual quote-unquote scare? Purdue, Iowa, Maryland, etc. And we get back to normal next week. Your thoughts, Chris? Uh, you know, I don't know that I would call it a scare game so much because we knew what they were coming in with. It wasn't a scare game. It was just a challenging game. Um, and what I've seen from our upcoming opponents, though, no. I don't think um, that we really have to worry about an Illinois coming in here. I mean, they are playing improved, but they still aren't anywhere near the class of where Ohio State's at. Um, honestly, of all our games coming up, if, if there is a game that you're, you're I would call a trap game, yeah, it, I think it's going to be the rivalry game. I Really? Really? Do. Oh, okay. Because I'll uh, tell you what, I saw Cade McNamara out there, and, and he looked really good, and he gave that team a spark. He did give them a spark. But let us not forget they were about to lose to Rutgers. Oh, I agree. But, I mean, I just – Will they stick it, with them? <laughs> I, I, th- I think they have to stick with them. More important question is, are they going to stick with their defensive coordinator? Because that defense is looking awful. Oh, it's Swiss cheese, man. Bad. Um, I, I'm going to say Illinois actually might be the best of the next three teams we play. If you've watched them the last two weeks, they've got a new quarterback. He's a freshman. Mm-hmm. They were going to give him a year to develop. They don't have that year of time to develop him anymore. They're putting him into the game. And we'll get into this uh, Wednesday when we preview Illinois for, for all of you. Uh, he is a heck of an athlete. There are some really, really good young quarterbacks in the Big Ten, guys. Um, and he's one of them. He might actually – Illinois might be the best of the last three teams we play, believe it or not. Um, also, next week is Penn State, Michigan, if you want to watch that train wreck, um, which we'll have Sean and Kevin on this week, hopefully, uh, to get <laughs> to get their two cents on what has been going on with their teams. All right, those are questions for this week. Thank you so much for submitting to those, everybody. Let's now talk about what happened this week, Chris. I it, This caught me off guard. I believe it was Thursday night, late Thursday evening. The nation's number one quarterback in the 2022 class, Quinn Ewers, who just decommitted from Texas, mind you, uh, made an announcement that he is going to be committing to the Ohio State Buckeyes. Uh, I was shocked. I didn't see this one coming. I mean, I was hoping that he was going to eventually um, uh, commit to Ohio State, but you just never know. It's recruiting. It, the fact that he committed so quickly after he decommitted from Texas tells you he's been thinking about this a while. And he is the nation's number two overall recruit in 2022, according to the 247 Sports Composite. Uh, 247 actually has him number one overall. He's the number one quarterback in the nation and the number one commit from the state of Texas. Quinn Ewers is going to be a Buckeye um, unless he decides to decommit again. But I usually, when this, something like this happens, they decommit and then they recommit that quickly. They're going to stick to it. Quinn Ewers, what do you think of this guy? Well, I mean, first of all, how can you not be excited about a quarterback room that, I mean, we've got Justin Fields now, but he's presumably headed for the draft. But, you know, we've got C.J. Stroud, Jack Miller. we got Kyle McCord coming in, and now we add Quinn Ewers. I mean, just wow. Sick. I mean, it is. You know, he's he's six foot three. He's 195, pro-style quarterback, but with mobility. And he's got a pocket awareness that allows him to extend plays out. He's got the athleticism to pull the ball down and take off running. You know, I saw some clips of this guy. He's got a really, really smooth delivery. He's got good velocity. He can change arm angles on his delivery. Um, and just has he has the arm strength to go over the top. I mean, with the receivers and tight ends that we have and have coming in, wow. I mean, it, there's just so much to be excited about with this guy. He has got an amazingly powerful arm, Chris. I don't know if you've seen the video of him throwing an 85-yard ball. I have not seen that one. It's and I'm, Granted, he does a crow hop. He's, he's running into it, but I don't care. 
if you run into it or you crow hop or whatever. That's a can. You, if you can throw the football over 80, 80 yards, 85 yards, that is massive. Um, so he's got a very powerful arm. But what I love about him is he throws with touch. Yes. He's got so much touch on his passes. Love that. I would say he's got decent pocket awareness for his age. That's something that develops as with a quarterback over time. Um, the fact that he has some of it already and he's only a junior in high school, that's a plus. Um, the other thing, too, that I saw in his uh, film that was surprised me, he's deceptively fast, Chris. Yes. Um, he is not a statue in that pocket. He can get out of the pocket. They roll him out a lot at his high school. Um, and, but he can get out of the pocket and throw on the run, and he can throw with accuracy and touch on the run. That's why he is the nation's number one uh, quarterback in the 2022 class. Um, now, some things that I think Ryan Day is going to have to work with him. He carries the football a little low in his dropbacks. I like to see a quarterback hold that thing up uh, you know, by their chest. He, he holds it down by his belly a little bit. And then that what happens is when he goes into his motion to throw, that creates an elongated arm motion. Right. Which which break in which make, takes more time. OK, you want a quick snap of the football, which is why they have you carried up by your chest or up by your ear in your drop back so that you can quickly snap the ball when you throw. Um, you know who had a really quick release, even though it looked really awkward? Pinnix yesterday. He has a yes. quick release of the football. That's what you want to see, a quick release with action and, and finesse of that football. That's something he's got to work on. So he's got some technical flaws possibly um, that he needs to work on a little bit. But, again, you can't argue the results that you're seeing. And here's the other thing I saw in his film, Chris, that when I saw it, I had to reply it a couple times because I was like, holy crap, he's looking off defenders already. This is a high school kid who's a junior who knows how to look off defenders to give himself just a little bit more of a window to throw the football to to a receiver. And he knows how to put that football in those windows. Ryan Day is getting himself a very good quarterback here. Now, will he beat out C.J. Stroud, Jack Miller, or Kyle McCord to become a starter as a freshman? I don't know. And here's what I want to get into with this discussion. As we head closer to the end of this of the show, Chris, you mentioned it. This room is stacked. Number one, how is Ryan Day convincing these guys to come here? And number two, how does the rest of these quarterbacks look at something like this? Because only one guy can play quarterback at a time, man. And when you have a room full of four studs like this, obviously with the way the rules are in college football now, the transfer portal is looking awful interesting for Ohio State in the future, a la <clears throat> Joe Burrow, anybody? Yeah, yeah, and, and that is definitely a concern. I mean, I think a lot is going to be determined by who starts next year. Um, you know, obviously Justin's going to be in the draft. I don't think any of us have any doubts about that. Right. Um is it C.J. Stroud or is it Jack Miller? You know, or does McCord or is, sneak or in? Or is there? Kyle McCord? <laughs> it's gonna be a three-horse race next year. That's why I've already told people next year's spring, and and hopefully COVID is gone by then. We can actually have a normal spring. Um, next year's spring is gonna be very very interesting. Um, if, we are if, gonna if, see, I think, one of them enter the portal. Between CJ and Jack? Yes. I agree. I, I, I do agree. But here's the thing, and this is what I think Ryan Day is doing. Because of the portal, I think Ryan Day is using it to his advantage. He's basically saying, hey, listen, come and compete. Get some training from me. I'm the, I'm the number one college uh, developer of quarterbacks right now. Uh, it's me. People might say Rink, Lincoln Riley might be in that, but I, I don't know. I think Ryan Day actually is better than Lincoln Riley, in my opinion. But I'm biased. Point being, I think Ryan Day is saying to these guys, come on, what are you afraid of, competition? That's not you. You're a competitor. Why don't you come on? I'll develop you. 
take get a year or two of development. Either you win the starting position because you're that good, or you get into the transfer portal and you take my development and you go to another team and you become Joe Burrow. That's what he's telling these kids. I guarantee it. And it's working because they're coming. I mean, at this point, you could have four future NFL quarterbacks all in one room, the same room, quarterback room. That's amazing, Chris. Oh, I agree. I mean, it's phenomenal. So there you have it, guys. That's I think I think that's what Ryan Day's doing. I like it. I, I think it, obviously quarterback is the name of the game here, guys, when it comes to um, winning at the clip that you need to win a national championship. Look at the teams competing for national championships. They all have great quarterbacks now. That's the name of the game in college football. All right, Chris, um, why don't you take us around the Big Ten and what was a crazy weekend, man? Oh, it was. It, it was an absolutely phenomenal weekend of football. Um, as we've talked about, you know, in the battle for the East, between the undefeateds, the Buckeyes were able to withstand an aerial assault from the Hoosiers, hang on 42 to 35. There was also a battle out uh, west between a couple undefeateds with a very stingy Northwestern defense shutting down Graham Mertz and what has to this point been a potent Northwestern offense. They forced four fumbles, recovering two, intercepted Mertz three times. Uh, and then for Northwestern, Ramsey went out and managed an efficient game, uh, going 23 of 44 for 203 and two touchdowns. You know, you and I have been down on them all season. Northwestern, I think, is for real. That defense is for real. Um, Minnesota handed it Purdue its second loss on the strength of 102 yards and three touchdowns from uh, Muhammad Ibrahim, along with a very controversial offensive pass interference play against Purdue at the end of the game. Uh, Iowa played some great defense, getting five sacks, two fumbles, and two picks including a pick six and handing Penn State their fifth straight loss. Penn mm. State now 0-5. Who would have thought? Mm. Illinois picked off McCaffrey, uh, Luke McCaffrey three times, created four fumbles, three of them by McCaffrey, recovering two of those fumbles, and had 100 yards rushing from Mike Epstein and Chase Brown uh, in dispatching Nebraska 41-23. to The guys up north... Uh, needed three overtimes to defeat Rutgers and prevent a fourth straight loss. Cade McNamara provided, as I said earlier, a huge spark for the Wolverines after replacing a very ineffective Joe Milton. Uh, McNamara went 27 to 36 for 260, four touchdowns through the air and added a rushing touchdown in the second overtime. Rutgers did put up a valiant effort. Uh, Verdal was 29 of 43 of 43 for 381 and three touchdowns, but they just, they fell short. And finally over in College Park, Maryland, for the second week in a row, the Turtles wouldn't come out of their shell, declining to play (laughs) Sparty this week and sitting this one out. So our updated standings have the Buckeyes at 4-0 leading the East, followed by 4-1 Indiana, 2-1 Maryland, 2-3 Michigan, one and three Michigan State, one and four Rutgers, and as I said before, wow, an 0 and five Penn State. Over on the west half of the bracket, we've got uh, five and 0 Northwestern, two and one Wisconsin, three and two Iowa, who's making a late surge here. Uh, Purdue at two and two, Minnesota two and three, Illinois second win in a row, two and three, and then Nebraska at one and three. Yeah, it's a it's a, after last last night and this weekend's games, Chris. It looks like Northwestern and Ohio State are on a crash course for Indianapolis, um, which will be the second time in three years that we would play the Wildcats for a Big Ten championship. I'm shocked with Northwestern. I am shocked. After I, I thought that what they're doing this year is what I thought they were going to do last year. So yeah. the fact the fact that they had a just a horrendous year last year and they've been able to flip the script again and they have they're having their 2018 and 2020 is amazing to me. Um, 
I can't figure out Purdue in Minnesota. I thought they were going to be better. Iowa all of a sudden seems to be rallying around the troops. Kirk Ferentz becomes, I believe, the third or fourth coach in fourth. Big Ten his fourth in Big Ten history with 100, 100 wins. Um, I can name you two of them. I think it's Earl or um, Bo Schimbeckler and Woody Hayes, right? That's correct. And I don't know the third the one. The third Maybe. has me escaped. I, I actually heard it earlier, and I, it, it, it you know, me. I want to say he coached for Chicago. It was like I feel like it was someone who wasn't even in the Big Ten now, like for a school wasn't even the Big Ten. But I digress. Um, Kirk Ferentz has basically entered legendary status, which is hilarious when you take a look at the fact how many games he's lost to, which just means he's been there as old as time as Aaron would say he's as old as dirt. Um, so yeah, uh, the fact that Iowa turned it around surprises me. The fact that Northwestern is, is undefeated surprises me. The fact that Indiana, I feel is the second best team in the big 10 surprises me. It's 2020. It's just, everything is crazy. The only thing that really feels normal and natural right now is Ohio state's undefeated as well. Right. That's it. Um, guys, we have a we have a great show planned for you this week. We're gonna we're gonna preview Illinois for all of you. Um, believe me, I know most of the time when we looked at the beginning of the season, we thought Illinois, what a walkover. This is not gonna be a pushover anymore. I think Illinois is actually a decent game. Um, it's in Champaign, late in November. It's gonna be cold and rainy probably. Um, late season against Illinois in bad weather. Yeah, we've seen that script before. Tressel can tell you all about that. Um, so we're going to preview them, get you all set up for Saturday. It's going to be a noon kick Saturday in Champaign, Illinois on FS one Fox sports one. So yeah, that try good luck finding that one on your, uh, on your, uh, dial there. <clears throat> so, uh, hopefully you'll be able to find it. Um, it to be an interesting game. I think, um, Michigan Penn state play this week. Uh, I, <laughs> Uh, we'll we'll hopefully have Kevin and Sean on to to talk about their teams and preview that game. I mean it's the it's become the toilet bowl this year, but uh, it might be who whoever wins keeps their job and whoever loses might get fired type of thing. So what do they they used to have wrestling matches that way uh, retirement matches? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this, might, this might be a retirement cage match here. Uh, Nebraska plays Iowa on Friday, the day after Thanksgiving. That's gonna be a lot of fun. That's a big rivalry game. Um, Usually, the way Nebraska, after losing to Illinois the way Nebraska did, after I thought they turned the corner, just a little, you know, that's a little interesting. Wisconsin and Minnesota all of a sudden becomes an interesting game because I thought Wisconsin was much better than what they played against Northwestern. Either Northwestern is for real or Wisconsin was not nearly as good as we thought they were. And, of course, they've only had three games, so their sample size is much smaller. Um, so that, that that'll be a good one as well. But uh, there's some real stinkers out there. Northwestern, Michigan State, Purdue, Rutgers. Those are those are some stinkers this week. But uh, the Big Ten is going to be interesting, man. Again, in closing, take a deep breath. We won. We held on. Yes, there's a glaring issue with this team in the defensive backfield. But if there's if coaching, if it's going to happen, if we're going to win a national championship, they're going to have to turn it around. That's what we'll be watching. In the coming weeks with Ohio State, can they get that defensive backfield turn around, turned around, going in the right direction? Chris, your final thoughts for this podcast? Well, I'll tell you, I'm just uh, call me call, uh, call me optimistic. I, I think this was a big thing because th- this was a great win. Because I'll tell you, as I said in the beginning, we took everything a very good Indiana team had to offer, and we still came out on top with our best player playing his worst game. So yeah. I, I really think that we've got a whole lot to be excited about. And I've got the ultimate confidence in the coaching staff that they're going to get this, you know, the defensive back issue turned around with, with time and, and, and coaching. I think we're going to be okay come the end of the season. I, I, I'm not ready to, you know, say the sky is falling in Columbus just yet. So I, yeah, I think we've got a whole lot to be excited about. I agree. Let's see if we can put four quarters together. This team still has not put four quarters together, man. If we can put four quarters together offensively and defensively, like we've seen them do in spurts at times, this is a national championship team. I agree. Let's stay optimistic. 
As always, everybody, be kind to one another. I owe someone's OH in Sin Carmen, Ohio, with all of your heart. And until next time, OH! I owe! Go Bucks! Oh, come, let's sing, oh, highest praise and songs through armor rain while our hearts rebounding thrill and joy which death alone can still summer's heat Oh, winter's cold, the seasons pass, the years will roll. Time and change will surely show how firm thy friendship. Oh, hi, yo.